Hey DerbyCon, if you're watching this video, it means that my wife is giving birth to our third child, which while I'm sad I'm not down there with you guys, I wouldn't miss the delivery for the world. I hope you guys can understand. So I'm Liam Randall, and I'm primarily here to represent the blue side, the defensive side of this talk. I have a CS degree and cut my teeth doing large scale network uh, administration. I've been consulting for the last 10 years and have spent the last few focusing specifically on IR. I've been consulting for the last 10 years and have spent the past few years focusing specifically on incident response. If you've met me personally, you're, you'll already know that I have a real passion for open source software and found a home on the Bro Core team. This year, especially, Bro became my full-time job and I'm currently working on product development. I spend a lot of time teaching people about Bro, putting out workshops and training. I'm teaching a half dozen classes still remaining this year. If you're interested, please check out my blog at liamrandall.com. I got involved in this talk specifically because I have a real interest in advanced red team tactics. The stuff that Kyle does really scares the crap out of me. He's out there developing new and novel approaches to penetration testing. From my point of view, it's harder to defend against things you don't truly understand. So let's pick up right where Kyle left off. By this point, you should start to pick out on what we're trying to communicate today. It's that ICS embedded systems are really soft, soft targets. And while there are dozens of distinct methods of attacking and exploiting these devices, we're just trying to demonstrate a couple. The ultimate message is that all of these things you're already doing on the PC side work with only minor modifications in this space. Your entire arsenal can be deployed. So we've been pretty deliberate about our target selection and exploit vector. We took down a SCADA controller with an ICS protocol bug over TCP IP. We took down um, a common key set via serial interface attack, something that requires you to be physically present. For this next one, we're gonna do something a little more common, somewhat pedestrian, but a more persistent and prevalent vulnerability, default credentials. So before we move on to the defense side, let's run through just one more example. This time we're going to use default credentials to attack a common brand of PTZ camera. Okay, so on to our target. There are lots of models and manufacturers to choose from. I chose the Sony PTZ because it's a relatively high-end brand with a very large deployment footprint. I spent a little time researching and I found absolutely no record of the technique that I'm about to demonstrate for you published anywhere. Now, default credentials are certainly not a zero day. However, I'm going to demonstrate how easy it is to build and upload a Trojan firmware for one of these devices. Okay, so onto the device itself. Let's take a look at this guy. So it's got built-in ethernet. It can have optional Wi-Fi, a couple expansion slots to add uh, a memory on it. Um, as far as protocols, it speaks the uh, regular uh, TCP IP suite. Uh, it only has eight megabytes of memory on board because uh, this is one of their older models. Um, it has a, as on the camera side, it's got 25 times optical zoom, multiple frame rates and codecs, uh, and then the camera actually supports any little interface model on the back. So it's kind of a camera uh, ICS controller at once. It has alarm inputs as well as a couple serial interfaces. So these things are commonly set up to do things like um, uh, buzz open gates or doors or uh, key on um, pressure sensors or, or things like that. They're great. There are a lot of new models in this series, but this, this one's fine. So let's take a walk through how the firmware in this device is updated. So again, the uh, what we're starting with today is finding a device that has default credentials. So the first thing you do is simply authenticate to the device. Then, checking the IP, you can use the CGI commands to remotely turn the FTP server on or off. So if I wanted to upload my payload, I would obviously turn that on. I then FTP to the device and create a web home directory and upload uh, whatever I want the device to end up with. I go ahead and push my resources up and then I make another CGI call and then boom, I own this camera. So the, what, the technique that we're about to demonstrate, I'm just going to upload a payload that I generated using the social engineering toolkit. Uh, however, we could easily use the techniques that Kyle just demonstrated to build custom executables for this device or a myriad of other techniques. So 
So what I've done here is I've already logged on to a camera here on a local subnet, uh, 192.168.0.236. Uh, this is a PTZ camera, and since the camera itself takes a, you know, runs a little slow, I've already uploaded this web directory to the camera. So if we take a look at what I have in the web directory, what I've done is I've copied the uh, existing firmware so the camera will uh, continue to function as far as a um, you know the the Java controls for viewing images and so forth and then I also created a new subdirectory called set payload where I've just done a simple um, uh, a Java based uh, website attack so let's go ahead and browse out to the camera itself and take a look at what this thing looks like okay so up in a browser here I have the Sony PTZ already loaded, and we could log on and browse. Looks like I have a um, HTML error in the firmware that I've uploaded, but not a big deal. We can still see images off this camera. Uh, and we can also browse directly to this camera itself. And you'll see that I'm launching a Java attack against um, this user. Now, this is a relatively unsophisticated attack. Uh, what I could do is actually edit the default for, uh, HTML files that come with this camera and build something right into the default home page, uh, which would I think be a very sophisticated attack because these cameras do prompt you themselves to up, you know, to uh, uh, run Java uh, uh, utilities and so forth. So, um, if this were a real attack, I would go ahead and. Uh, launch that and now I would have connected back to uh, my instance of Kali here and the system would be pwned. So there are the greater technique here that I'm tr attempting to demonstrate is simply that that these cameras in these embedded devices are a platform that you can use to pivot throughout the rest of the infrastructure. Okay so what's the big deal? So we've had three demonstrations today so far that kind of go into some more advanced uh, red team tactics. Do these things really matter in the real world? Are these things that you need to be concerned about in your environment? And this is where the story takes a very interesting twist and why I think that we're going to demonstrate very quickly that this is a real thing to be concerned about. In early 2012, there was a study that was released that was called the Karna Botnet, or the Great Internet Census of 2012. Uh, internally, uh, a, a team out at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab referred to it as the alien worm. Uh, there is a very bright group of individuals out there, uh, and an especially bright individual named uh, Shi Sharma. Uh, works on an incredible team of incident responders. He's a uh, bro power user, uh, and he's been involved so far with uh, the discovery of a large number of network anomalies. Um, some that he's talked about publicly are the 2011 Mordo worm, the 2012 alien worm that we're about to review, and the 2012 MySQL authentication bypass vulnerability. Uh, Ashish runs a very large bro cluster, and he uses it as a network telescope to basically get some insight into trends that are going on uh, uh, network-wide. So if you haven't read about the Karna botnet, uh, the paper they put up is wonderful. I highly suggest you read about it. Um, but let's just read uh, how they describe the worm themselves. Uh, so the first thing is um, access. Uh, how were they accessing these embedded devices? Um, and they, they note that we discovered an amazing number of open embedded devices on the internet. Many of them are based on Linux and allow logon to standard BusyBox with empty or default credentials. Uh, the scope was insecure devices are basically located everywhere in the internet. They're not specific to one ISP or country. So the problem of empty or default passwords is in an industry-wide phenomenon. Uh, in the uh, uh, deployment that they performed, they compromised 25% of the devices they found. Approximately 420,000 unique devices were compromised in this one worm. Uh, and then as far as a payload, the binary was a uh, the binary in the router was written in plain C. It was compiled for nine different architectures using the OpenWRT build root. Its latest and largest version, this binary was between 46 and 60 kilobytes in size, depending on the target architecture. Uh, and then they used these binary to actually scan the internet. Um, they actually 
tried to scan slash zero and you can download all the results if you're interested in seeing what a snapshot of the full internet looked like at the time. Uh, they were pretty sophisticated when they uh, conducted their scanning. They tried to go in low and slow. Uh, each device would only scan a, a couple of IP addresses each and a couple of ports. So let's take a look at, at the payload itself. So this is a directory listing of a compromised device. Now this is just a sample. Uh, we believe that there were multiple uh, revisions and uh, there would obviously be some minor differences between the nine unique uh, architecture that they uh, uh, targeted. Uh, for the device that this was captured off of, uh, the default password for this family of cameras is either root and blank or root and one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, the Linux itself reported back as High Linux BusyBox. Um, the total payload is just a little less than uh, 4K uh, with the scanning and the logs there. This file brm underscore v6k was the uh, the daemon that would spin up and run on on uh, TCP port 2010. Uh, and there were some other indications of this worm when it uh, this botnet when it first started operating. Uh, if you check uh, just isc.sans.edu, uh, the Internet Storm Center, uh, you can see some evidence of uh, this activity uh, running around the Internet. Um, and again, these were uh, a custom uh, payload. Uh, based on the research that Ashish had performed, uh, uh, this sample was taken on June 28th, 2012, uh, and looking back into his network, he saw activity back through May 30th of 2012. So if you, if you notice, there was a readme file uh, installed on the payload. And, and here are, uh, here's what the readme actually said. Your router had a very simple or no telnet password at all. We temporarily use it for a nonprofit research project to map the internet. All research results will be made public. We have no intent to damage your device or harm your privacy in any way. So, uh, and then they listed an email address to contact them uh, if you'd like. Um, and if you guys are here, the guys that perform that, I think you'd be uh, pretty easy to pick out. You'd be the guys walking funny because you have balls the size of footballs, considering the number of devices that you guys actually compromised. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the devices themselves. And I think this is where we really start to tie everything together. OpenWRT build root was used via default credentials to build a gigantic botnet to scan the entire internet. Dozens of vulnerable models were actually infected during the course of this botnet. Uh, and if you consider where cameras are deployed to begin with, they're already typically in your sensitive areas because it's where you want some kind of physical security. It's be, it could be behind your firewall. Uh, in the initial research into this botnet, uh, there was a very scary moment when all of the production was traced back to a single Chinese OEM. Now, initially, that was very concerning, but I think later, as the worm evolved and stayed relatively benign, uh, people began to realize that it was just a systematic problem in the design of the devices. And these are the, the super inexpensive uh, home security systems, small business security systems uh, that you see deployed everywhere. Uh, you probably, you may have one of these at your house now. You buy these at Amazon.com, on Costco, Sam's Club, hundreds of retailers online. And a picture is worth 420,000 devices. It's actually kind of beautiful when you look at it like this. And this this um, this graphic here was actually generated by the Karna botnet team. Uh, let, let's consider here a little ASN analysis. So ASNs are autonomous system numbers. Those are the uh, numbers that are given to the networks that make up uh, the internet itself. So 25% of these infections were on one single network. And that would be this big red area you can see over here in China. They were connected to China Telecom. Uh, and if you count the top five ASNs that the cameras were connected for, that uh, accounted for approximately 50% of these cameras, or 210,000 uh, devices. Um, and these were uh, primarily Asian ISPs, with the exception of um, Turk Telecom here. Uh, uh, you know, another hotspot of inexpensive Chinese cameras. 
uh, but there was a really, really long tail of infection. Uh, if you look at the map of the Carnotbotnet, it it generally reflects a, a map of the United States with a slight Asian, or a map of the global internet with a slight Asian bias here. Uh, the top 16 ASNs only accounted for 60% of infections. Um, ultimately, these inexpensive cameras are available in anywhere, uh, everywhere, uh, and they're deployed everywhere. I mean, you can even see these hotspots down in uh, South America here. Um, if you have an opportunity, pull up the paper. It is very interesting. Okay, so what does all this mean? These are systematic vulnerabilities. These are pervasive throughout the internet, and they go way beyond just uh, cameras and ICS. They affect almost every embedded device. Uh, if you follow this space, you'll find that there are vulnerabilities in copying machines, in all of the Internet of Things that we're putting out here. Uh, these are not just theoretical attacks. As the Karna botnet shows, there are sophisticated operators that recognize the opportunity and are taking advantage um, uh, now. Uh, the tool chain has essentially evolved to a level where it is now a trivial effort to port all of our existing uh, tactics, uh, uh, tools and procedures to uh, the embedded uh, ICS space. Um, and unfortunately, that means that this is a problem that we all need to mitigate. So how do we find this stuff? You know, when we're talking about ICS uh, and embedded world, um, these are defensively handicapped products to begin with. Um, when we talk about finding this stuff, I think generically we mean we want to find bad stuff, but let's first also consider how we find stuff in general in this space. Um, and the sad reality is, is that the traditional techniques that, that we've been trained on just do not meet the needs of the embedded ICS world. You know, when you consider the uh, things that you may do in your network now, you may conduct a little network scanning. Um, a lot of times you will be specifically excluded from scanning, you know, things like your medical resources um, uh, or your uh, power control or water control equipment because you don't want to take it down. Um, patch management programs for these things are non-existent. You're lucky to get semi-regular firmware updates, never mind um, having something like SCCM or uh, a management utility that can help you. Um, you rarely have access to the system logs in these devices. Uh, at best, you might have syslog, um, but sometimes they're just very difficult to configure. Uh, there's no AV that runs on these things. There's no host-based intrusion detection systems that can uh, help to alert you. Uh, again, things like uh, uh, Nessus and Nmap, uh, the scanners are wonderful. They do include sometimes routines for mapping these devices out. Um, but a lot of times you don't have that, that second step, that, that log on agent that then logs into the device and queries it for local vulnerabilities or problems. Um, signatures can be effective. Um, there is a wonderful project called Digital Bond that specifically addresses some of the worst in the ICS space. Um, so that's a that's a, an area that we can kind of turn to. Flow data uh, is an area that is very helpful because it helps you to understand you know the kind of ground truth of what's going on in your network. Um, and then there's always segmentation. Uh, but the the TLDR is, is that most of these techniques just don't don't um, don't work any longer. So when we consider uh, traditional intrusion detection systems, um, let's take a step back and just, just look at it from a very high level. Uh, classically speaking, if you read the academic literature, if you study this uh, professionally, you'll find that, that usually IDSs are broken down into two distinct and separate categories. You've got your signature-based IDSs and your anomaly-based IDSs. Uh, your signature-based detection are, are the things that you typically think about. You know, This would be like uh, snort rules or um, atomic indicators of bad things, bad domains, bad file hacks hashes, bad IPv4, v6 addresses, and so forth. Uh, anomaly detection is defined uh, uh, somewhat differently depending on uh, where you check, but I think that, that it generally means that you're going to use things like um, traffic analysis, flow analysis, and protocol analysis with a little bit of magic and special sauce to sort of determine when things are different on your network.
So the system that I spend a lot of time working on is called the Pro Platform. Um, and it is essentially a hybrid platform that offers the best of both worlds. But more importantly, it includes this very powerful programming language that um, is what really separates it from everything else that seems to be out on the market today. Um, and we really try to focus on that area where we can kind of bring together um, all of this uh, uh, unique uh, intelligence. So seriously, so what is Bro? So Bro is three things, uh, and it does three things. So when we talk about what Bro is, uh, we talk about first there is this Bro platform, and that would be the, the utilities and the APIs and all the management stuff you need to get it up and going. Uh, the second thing that Bro is, is a programming language. It is a Turing complete programming language. It is uh, event based. Uh, syntactically, it looks a little bit like Python. Um, uh, and it's a very easy high level language to work with. Um, you never worry about, um, you know, cluster safe anything. It's all sort of embedded uh, and taken care of in the uh, language for you, regardless of the size of the network that you're programming for. And then there are applications that run on the Bro platform that are written in the Bro programming language. So the first big application that people talk about uh, and, and sometimes mean when they say Bro is just Bro IDS. And we'll look at what Bro IDS does in, in just a minute. But other applications also include uh, use cases for network monitoring, vulnerability management, DLP, uh, traffic analysis, uh, file analysis. Uh, and, and in reality, the thing to keep in mind is, is that all of these apps are really just Bro scripts written in the Bro programming language. So Bro is three things. It does three things. Uh, uh, the first thing it does is it writes, um, uh, actually, before we talk about what it does, let's look at what, what, what Bro looks like on the network. So Bro takes a passive feed of all traffic on the network. So it doesn't matter um, what the device looks like on the other side. It doesn't matter if it's an ICS controller or a camera or a, um, or a, a Polycom IP phone or a server or a tablet, if it's speaking TCP IP and it transits the tap that Bro's listening to, then Bro understands it and can statefully track and follow that conversation. Uh, it gives you then access to, to all, all the layers of that traffic. If you think about the, the TCP IP cake, if you will, you have, all, you have access to all those different layers um, as you interface with the traffic and you can do things. So uh, the first thing that Bro does is it writes these very, very rich protocol logs. You get one of these protocol logs for each protocol that Bro is uh, decapsulating, plus a bunch of extra logs as you see fit. Uh, Bro is very, very easy to customize. So the idea is, is that you can even append things onto the existing logs, like GOIP information or ASN databases or um, uh, atomic indicators uh, of intelligence, things like that. Uh, if you're Unixy, you would love Bro logs. They're very highly structured. So uh, when we say highly structured, we mean here, uh, what I've done to help you kind of understand that is I've put the data type under the field name here for each one. So count is the bro word for integer. So you know that everything in this column, if you want to access it uh, using the bro programming language, is always going to be an integer. This is always going to be a string. And so Bro will alert you to things. Bro IDS comes pre-configured with a variety of signatures and an anomaly notifications, and we can look into more on that later. <clears throat> and then there's the most exciting part about Bro, which is that programming language. So this is that real power that lets you take all the things that are in Bro and that Bro has access to and pivot. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to look at using uh, these ed um, uh, hybrid uh, anomaly and signature based detection systems to sort of look at what's going on in the network. So how do we how do we start to defend these ICS systems? You know, we've kind of looked at a variety of these attacks today. How do we stop these things from happening? And I think that uh, we need to begin with, you know, understanding what you have. You know, what is what does network monitoring look like? When you're when you're looking at these systems, you know the Socratic idea was to know thyself. So let's look at this camera here. So this is a graph of uh, traffic, um, where green is HTTP traffic. So if I just browse to this uh, that Sony PTZ camera we looked at, and I open up and I start looking at uh, the stream, this is what I see on the network. 
just just HTTP traffic. Now, the attack that we uh, uh, executed on this, where we uploaded our own firmware, um, obviously looks completely different. Here we're seeing um, FTP traffic and FTP data. So these are the kind of things that you should start to monitor for in your network. You know, is your network supposed to look like um, uh, A or B here? Uh, these are these are uh, easy things that when you look at them make sense. And you can use a system like Bro to use a simple if statement to do some things like uh, protocol pinning. So looking at that Bro connection log uh, that we were talking about a few minutes ago, here's another perspective on that ground truth. Um, just monitoring uh, for every uh, network connection that we saw there, there were 14 HTTP connections in that normal traffic when we just saw that green line. Whereas uh, in that in the second graph where we saw the you know the purple and the red for um, FTP and FTP data, uh, we see that there was a significant um, uh, amount of other traffic. So helpfully, you know, the greater idea that you may want to know about your network is simply when do I have new services appear on my network? Do I have a new FTP server startup somewhere? Do I have a new HTTP server some startup somewhere? Is a server now speaking SSL that wasn't before? And very helpfully, uh, Bro will write a single log line for, um, very helpfully, Bro will write a single log line for each new service that appears in the logs when it appears. So even just hooking this log and having Bro email you daily or hourly or immediate summaries of results for when these things are turned on can be very instructive. So digging deeper into the protocols themselves, though, you, you're not limited to just um, traditional NetFlow type records where you're just saying like, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to limit based on a, on a certain number of ports or even on a, on a protocol. Bro does dynamic protocol detection, so we put all the HTTP in there, and then if you want to care about what port it was running on, you can care about it. In this case, what I'm highlighting is, is that, that that if you know thyself well enough, or if it's an application that's important, that is important enough, you can even pin and have Bro alert on things like the URIs that were accessed, or the number of times that URIs were accessed. You you have this uh, new range of detection methodologies at your fingertips that that really empower you as the security professional to enforce policies in a way that you just can't do with another system. So let's take a step back real quick and make sure that we understand something about uh, Modbus because we're, we're going to kind of dig deeper into a more complicated uh, device and look at how we can secure it uh, using um, uh, these new tools and programming languages on our network. So if you're, if you're not that familiar with Modbus, uh, Modbus is a very old serial communications protocol that's uh, now uh, used and implemented over TCP IP and has been for quite some time. Uh, to connect these large uh, devices uh, or networks of discrete devices around. So where you find these things are uh, in big, uh, expensive devices with capital life cycles. So think like uh, power plants, think about water treatment plants, think about um, assembly lines, uh, oil uh, and transportation, maritime, uh, uh, military, fracking, you know, these uh, RTUs, uh, remote terminal units, are what you use to connect um, to things like uh, humidity or temperature or flow or pressure sensors. Uh, and, and they essentially can be pre-programmed to tell you to just t uh, read in some sort of a, take a reading and then pass it back to the SCADA network. The SCADA is the supervisory control and data acquisition uh, side of the network. That's the stuff up here. Um, and, and these SCADA controllers are what sort of interpret the logic of, of, of the device. If you look at the protocols themselves, and we will in just a minute, you'll see that the protocols themselves uh, need context to really understand what's going on there. So just as we were looking at the con.log and the http.log, Bro includes um, some SCADA protocol analyzers. So the uh, zero day that Kyle uh, popped earlier was uh, on a protocol that is not as common. It's called 6NAT, but the two most common are called Modbus, uh, and the second most common is DNP3. And the way that these networks work are, you'll have a number of these devices here, and these devices uh, can communicate as sort of masters and slaves. So 
out of the box, there are scripts here that, that give you that deep intelligence into your network. So you could say, is it normal to have these new devices acting as masters on my network? Now, you're obviously going to need some um, to know something about the network to enforce these kinds of things. But where SCADA devices are usually installed are these sort of expensive, higher order um, uh, devices where it would be worth it because you're trying to protect some kind of critical infrastructure or assets. So just as with HTTP, we were digging uh, deeper into the protocol itself and looking at some of the logic inside it, we have similar access to Modbus. Uh, here we're just talking about what is actually being done uh, on the registers uh, itself, uh, but we can actually even dig in one step deeper if you're familiar with the logic and actually pull the registers off the Modbus, out of the Modbus protocol in real time. Um, now, this would require some, some real sophisticated uh, um, knowledge of what these registers stood for. You'd want to know that, um, uh, that register 8002, um, you know, what this, what this current value, I'm sorry, re what register 6352, what a jump from 8000 to 13000 uh, actually means. Is that, is that relevant or statistically significant in your network? Um, mining the uh, uh, logs out of a couple of these registers, um, uh, a team member at the International Computer Science Institute was able to, to generate this graph of uh, SCADA uh, register changes over time. And you can see here that, that this blue line could be something like a pressure switch or a valve switch, and maybe this is the impedance of some circuit here, you know, so maybe it's measuring a, a tank that's getting full. I, I, I have no idea. But that's actually a great thing to say because I have no idea what these things actually represent. However, if you do know what they should represent or if you are aware of what normal operating ranges are for a particular power plant or a, uh, a phase change uh, on a device or um, when uh, certain sensors should be open and not, you could detect things like advanced attacks within your uh, infrastructure. Uh, I'd like to talk more about this, and I will be actually talking about this uh, uh, in somewhat detail uh, at Mircon, uh, but today I just don't think we have time to go into the uh, nitty-gritty detail.